Welcome. My name is Richard Fallenbaum, and I'm going to be the moderator of the session of the a series of one of the series of sessions of the Sunday morning at the Marxist Library. This is a series of presentations from a Marx, generally Marxist perspective um, that have been running for about 15, 16 years, um, mostly out of the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, California. During the last two years, or more actually now, um, we've been on virtual online and Zoom, and we've expanded um, our audience throughout the world. And um, uh, so welcome around the world from wherever time zone you're in, or uh, welcome. Um, our, our speaker today is Robert Jensen, who is an emeritus professor of, uh, from the Department of Journalism and Media, Media at the University of Texas. He'll be speaking about um, referring to his book, um, The uh, Inconvenient Apocalypse, Environmental Collapse, Climate Crisis, and the Fate of Humanity. He's um, speaking to us today from uh, just outside Taos, New Mexico. So welcome, Robert. You go ahead. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thanks to everybody. I am here in the mountain time zone, uh, happily uh, out on the edge of nowhere, as some people might describe it. Uh, it's great to be uh, with you all, uh, of course, it's required of us to say, I wish we were in person and we're getting close to the time when that might happen again, I hope. Uh, I do wanna talk about this new book, An Inconvenient Apocalypse, Environmental Collapse, Climate Crisis and the Fate of Humanity, which will be coming out in September. It's co-written with uh, Wes Jackson. But I thought I would start by introducing myself and saying also a bit about Wes. Uh, I'm a retired professor. Uh, I uh, would call myself probably not a Marxist, but an unaffiliated leftist. My roots are in both radical feminist critiques of sexual exploitation, uh, critiques of American imperial and militarist policy, uh, as well as all the other associated issues, all of which of course require, if one is sensible, uh, a deep critique of capitalism, which has been part of my life politics and teaching since I kind of woke up at the age of 30 to all of these things. Uh, I have written on all of these subjects, uh, less as an academic uh, and more as a, a sort of in, you know, public intellectual is the term they use sometimes. But while I was a professor and I did get tenure through the usual scholarly route, the minute I got tenure, I kind of turned my back on that world and tried to spend all of my time that I wasn't teaching engaged in the community, both as an organizer, as well as a writer and speaker. Uh, and so I've written on all of the, the subjects that are considered kind of central to the left, uh, gender and race, uh, imperialism, capitalism, uh, critiquing the domination subordination systems that are at the heart of all of those social systems. Uh, but I've also always been interested in understanding more the, the, what you could call the overarching system of domination and subordination, the human domination of the larger living world. And in that, I have learned a lot from a man named Wes Jackson. Uh, so let me take a brief minute to explain who Wes is because I think he's one of the most important environmentalists that people don't know. Wes is 85 years old, 20 years my senior. Um, he was part of the environmental education move, movement going back to the late 60s and early 70s when that field emerged. He taught one, of, he directed and taught in one of the first environmental studies programs in the country. Uh, he left the academy at a fairly young age and co-founded something called the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. And the Land Institute started as an alternative school. Many of you will remember that age in the early mid 70s of 
an awareness of the inadequacy of contemporary educational models. And Wes and his wife went off and founded an alternative school. It fairly quickly morphed into more of a research center uh, focused on sustainable agriculture and is now one of the most well-known of those around the world. Uh, Wes is known primarily for developing something called natural systems agriculture, which is his word for the need, as he saw it, to shift from annual grains that are grown in monocultures. Uh, if you've ever been in the Midwest, you know what that looks like, a field of nothing but corn, wheat, soybeans. Right? Uh, Wes started asking the question, this industrial agriculture system, which is ecologically and socially ruinous, how can we shift to something more sustainable and just? And he began to think about, instead of annual grains grown in monocultures, how you could grow perennial grains in polycultures or in mixtures, which would help with the problems of soil erosion and soil degradation, which are in some ways every bit as threatening to human survival as climate change. Uh, to make a long story short, Wes has made an incredible contribution to how we think about these issues, as well as to the very specific research into a more sustainable agriculture. And his ideas, ever since I first read him back in the 1980s, had a really profound influence on me. Over the last 10 years, I've gotten the chance to know Wes and work with him. And when he retired from running the Land Institute full time, we began a number of media and writing projects, including uh, a book I published last year called The Restless and Relentless Mind of Wes Jackson, in which I tried to summarize what I thought were his key insights into the nature of our ecological crises. Um, and that captures Wes's personality. He's one of those restless and relentless people, always hammering away to understand the world more fully. Uh, after we finished that book, we decided to co-author uh, a book that tried to, to put the current, what I always call multiple cascading ecological crises. That is not just climate change, but a number of crises, which we're familiar with. Soil erosion and soil degradation, as I said, uh, chemical contamination of the land and the water and our own bodies, the alarming drop in biodiversity, as well as, of course, rapid climate destabilization. We wanted to talk about these ways, these problems in ways that are, I think are not common enough. And so there comes this book, An Inconvenient Apocalypse. I, a brief footnote, that title was not ours. Obviously, it's a play on Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. Um, I'm much more fond of the original title we had, which we borrowed from a song. The, the working title for book, the book was The Old Future is Gone. The old future is gone. That is the future we imagined uh, for so long, a future of ever-expanding bounty and material uh, comfort. Uh, of, uh, a future that was ex assumed to be one of endless expansion is, is now gone. We can no longer viably think of that future. So the old future that we thought about for so long is gone, and we have to think about a future of permanent contraction. Uh, the reason that's not the title of the book is the press explained to us that because 80% of book buying is online, it's all about the search terms, baby. <laughs> It's what many of you may know of, they call search engine optimization. That is, you have to have terms in the title that will show up on searches, such as the state of our world. So we succumbed to search engine optimization and came up with the title that we have. Uh, so that's the project. Let me briefly describe what the book covers and then focus on one particular chapter. The book starts by asking essentially, how do we understand where we are? Uh, and we talk about a, a kind of dual crisis, the crisis of consumption, which is undermining the health of ecosystems, and then the crisis of meaning, the fact that collectively as a species, we don't have um, a way to think about the meaning of our lives that allows us to deal with that consumption crisis. Uh, we point out that the, the problem of climate change, while you know, dramatic, of course, shouldn't be understood as the problem. 
but rather as a derivative of overshoot of too many people consuming too much. And that all of these ecological crises are a derivative of overshoot and trying to keep the focus there. Uh, from there, we move to the question, well, how did we get to this place? Which we take a, a long view historically. The problem we suggest is not just capitalism, not just imperialism, but uh, what Wes has long called the 10,000 year problem of agriculture. The human domestication of plants and animals, which goes back 10 to 12,000 years, was the, the first time that human beings began drawing down the ecological capital of the planet beyond replacement levels. Uh, and since then, we've just gotten increasingly efficient at that rapacious um, activity. Uh, from there, we talked about what we call the, far, the four hard questions that we have to confront as a species. And I'll come back to those for the bulk of our conversation. From there, uh, because both Wes and I grew up in uh, Protestant Christian traditions, although both of us long ago left traditional theological dogma behind, uh, we're both somewhat allergic to supernatural explanations for anything. But we do find some of the terminology, the concepts from Christianity and those traditions useful. So uh, we talk about how to understand the apocalyptic moment that we are in not as a synonym for the rapture or you know a kind of death cult, but as a way of thinking about the dramatic changes in human systems that are going to be necessary. Uh, we move on to talk about another theological term, largely from the Hebrew Bible, uh, a saving remnant, this idea that even in crisis, even when a, a group of people move through a very catastrophic period, there will always remain a saving remnant of the, the ideas that can make for meaningful human existence. And then finally, uh, we, we play around with the concept of grace. Again, not in a Christian setting, but we use the term ecospheric grace to think through the relationship of us, the human, to this larger living world, the ecosphere, what some people call nature. So that's the book uh, in short order. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to sketch what I call these four hard questions. And I think uh, in any group I've talked with or any friend I've talked with about this, there's something in the way we lay this out that somebody disagrees with. So I hope um, if there are uh, critiques, you're, you're quick to offer them. Uh, it's too late to change the text of the book, but we can always learn. What are these four hard questions? Uh, we say they are questions of size, scale, scope, and speed. And I'll go through them quickly and then come back to them. By size, we mean the size of the human population, asking a fundamental question, what is a sustainable size for the human population on the planet? By scale, we mean the scale of human organizations, social, political, economic organizations, that is, what kind of scale is appropriate to uh, a long-term human presence on the planet. By scope, we mean the scope of human competence to manage the high energy, high technology world that we have created. And by speed, we simply mean the speed at which change is necessary if there is to be a decent human future, perhaps if there is to be any human future at all. Uh, so let me go back through those and, and talk about why we think they're important. Let's start with the size. What is the sustainable size of the human population? Well, uh, this is, is dicey in mainstream culture, but on the left as well, partly because of the ugly history of talk about human population. We all can remember a time in which the most of the people who talked about the problem of human population were uh, white folks in fairly affluent societies who were preaching to brown folks in the third world about how they had to reduce their population. The reason I think people are skeptical about talking about this question is because of that ugly racist ethnocentric history. And we wanna divorce ourselves from that history. As I always say, the problem of human population of human numbers is not in the third world, it's in the first world. 
because we know that a, a raw number of human beings isn't really the question. It's a question of at what level are those human beings consuming? And so another reason people don't want to talk about population is because it implicitly connects us then to the question of what level of consumption is sustainable, right? So the, the reluctance to talk about population is partly because of that racist history, partly because it's uncomfortable to talk about the need to reduce consumption across the board. And also, I think we should recognize no one really has a plan for how to effectively reduce the human population to a sustainable level in a time frame necessary. So for all those reasons, people don't like to talk about the question of what is the sustainable size of the human population. Yet the fact that we don't want to talk about it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. Uh, I, I'm not one for predictions, either in this realm or, or anywhere else. And we can also know that there were mistakes made by early critics of the expansion of the human population for predictions. Most of you probably remember Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb, which in, I'd have to go back and look, 1972, I'm going to guess from memory, predicted there would be a massive human die-off within decades, which of course didn't happen. Uh, so this isn't about predictions. It's also not about setting a, an exact number. I am not smart enough, nor is anyone else, to say what is the sustainable size of the human population. But I do think it's fair to say that that number is considerably less than the 8 billion people we are almost at today. Now, what is the sustainable size of the human population at what level of consumption? Okay, well, it's hard to say, but if we can if we can understand it's less than 8 billion at less than the current level of aggregate consumption, which we know is not equitably distributed, right? we're talking about the aggregate consumption here, then how are we going to get there? Well, it's a tough one because it involves not only questions of birth control, it involves questions of how long modern high energy, high technology allows us to live. Uh, all sorts of things that pretty much nobody wants to talk about. But again, the fact that we may not want to talk about it doesn't mean that it's relevant. Uh, the ecologists I read, the people whose judgment I trust, lead me to believe that the likely sustainable level of the human population is probably somewhere around 2 billion. But let's assume uh, you know, it's twice that, 4 billion. Well, that's still half of the current population. Right? And again, Wes and I don't promote a plan because there is no plan we can pull off the shelf to achieve that. But until we start thinking about it, we're not gonna get very far on it. So that's size and everybody can imagine why it's not a fun topic to discuss. Well, what about scale? What is the appropriate scale of human organization? Here, you know, I have to think, I think we have to recognize human beings are animals, we have a nature that nature is expansive. People have been able to live over the entire planet in an incredibly wide variety of social uh, systems. But it doesn't mean there isn't a kind of human organization that is more that we are more adapted to. Here, Wes has a concept he's been talking about for 30 years now, I think is very important. It recognizes that we are a species out of context. And what he means by that is, if you think about human evolutionary history, about two and a half million years for the genus Homo, about 200 to 300,000 years for Homo sapiens, the vast majority of our evolutionary history was lived in small foraging bands, hunting and gathering societies, typically no more than 100. Up until agriculture, again, only 10,000 years ago, which is only 5% of our species history at most, far less if we think of a longer history, right? Uh, mass societies, nations of 300 million cities of many millions of peoples, these are not the conditions in which we evolved. The political organization we now take for granted, you know, the nation state, uh, is a very curious development in human history. The way I used to explain this to students is, what we take to be normal is actually exceedingly strange in human history. It's existed in evolutionary terms for only the blink of an eye. So it doesn't mean there is a single way to organize human beings into a polity. 
But it does mean we have to take into consideration the way we evolved and the way we, we operate psychologically, intellectually, right? to think about what is the appropriate scale of human organization. And I think, again, I don't have a, a off the shelf plan to lay out here, but I think we can understand that a decent human society is likely to be smaller and more flexible in organization than the large scale hierarchical societies we now take for granted as normal and are in fact very abnormal. All right, so size and scale. We're going to have to accept the need for a dramatically smaller human population in smaller and more flexible social organizations. Again, nobody really knows how we're gonna get there, but we should start thinking about it. Well, what about the scope of human competence? Um, we live in what I refer to as a high energy, high technology society. Again, a fairly recent development in human history. We did not start this process of creating and accumulating surplus until the invention of agriculture. There are only a few resource rich areas prior to that in which there was even a concept of surplus really. Right? And of course that first wave of human energy collecting through agriculture in which we started taking more and more of the carbon of the world led eventually to uh, tapping into another carbon pool, which was of the forests and getting the Bronze Age and the Iron Age using the carbon of the forest to smelt metals and create what we think of now as civilization. And then of course, more recently tapping into co uh, first coal and oil and natural gas, which dramatically accelerated this uh, energy acquisition. Right? And with that, of course, we've got a dramatic expansion of human technology. Uh, a direct result of all this excess energy we have available. Well, what has this led to? It's led to what Wes and some others have dubbed technological fundamentalism. What do we mean by that? Technological fundamentalism is the belief that any human problem can be solved by more high energy, high technology advances. And what makes it especially fundamentalist is that the current problems that were created by previous high energy, high technology are assumed to be solvable through more high energy, high technology. In other words, we're in a hole and we keep digging. And this is part of the philosophy I absorbed from Wes, the need to break with that technological fundamentalism and start thinking about what Wes and I call a creaturely worldview, to break with the industrial world and the way it shapes our imaginations and start thinking about what it means to be a creature. And there are you know, countless examples of this technological fundamentalism. One particularly noteworthy, of course, is the green revolution, the belief that high energy, high technology could improve, in quotes, agriculture, which has led to an agriculture that in fact is much more productive in terms of yield, but much more environmentally destructive. And now we have an agriculture even more brittle and dangerous than ever. Uh, nuclear energy, there's a whole bunch of examples where we create technologies that have unintended consequences that are both ecologically and socially destructive. And then when we have to face uh, the need to change, we tend to double down on more technology. The scope of human intelligence is not adequate to continue this according to me and Wes. Wes is fond of promoting what he calls an ignorance-based worldview, uh, which is not a, a cry for human stupidity. What Wes means by an ignorance-based worldview is to recognize that human knowledge, while extensive, is inadequate to the task of predicting the consequences of that knowledge. Wes says, better if we recognize that we are far more ignorant than we are knowledgeable, and proceed with caution. Right? And there have been many people promoting this. One common uh, articulation of it is the precautionary principle. We can talk more about that if folks like. All right, so there are too many people in social and political organizations that are too big, and we're too confident about our technological abilities. Uh, if we take that seriously, there has to be change, dramatic change. How much time do we have that? What is the speed of that change that's necessary? Again, I'm not 
in the business of making predictions, right? But I do think we have to recognize that we're talking about changes so dramatic that it's likely that we will not be able to achieve them in the time frame necessary. Right? Now, you might say, well, that's defeatist, but I think it's better to recognize the challenges as a spur to try to accelerate the pace at which we consider these problems. Right? And here, I think we're up against a, a serious problem of human optimism. Right? Uh, and I think that has been uh, a real deficit, right? The belief that somehow we're always going to figure this out in time. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention is probably the most dangerous uh, bumper sticker we're going to have to deal with because it assumes that any problem can be solved with human ingenuity in a time frame that's necessary. And I think that that is unlikely. Um, in the book, we use an example, and, and I'll, I'll end here. There's an old saying, it's usually uh, credited as a Chinese proverb, that says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. I'm sure many of you have heard that. And if that is simply a reminder that if you fail to do something in the past, but it still needs to be done, it's never too late to do it. That's a, a good instruction, right? That a, a past failure should not be an excuse for inaction today. But I think that that is uh, unfortunately a phrase that also has some negative consequences. So um, if we were gonna, let's take this in one year increments. To say that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time is today, well, that's just false. If the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time to plant a tree was 19 years ago. Right? Now, why is that important? Because, well, if we were too stupid 20 years ago to plant the tree, we were also too stupid 19 years ago to plant the tree. In other words, we seem to have a, an inability to, to, with the humility that Wes and I are talking about, start to take these actions. And if we didn't do it 19 years ago, we didn't do it 18 years ago, we didn't do it 17 years ago, why do we think magically we are gonna suddenly wake up one day and have a deeper sense of the nature of the crises and a, a stronger initiative to act? We, we aren't necessarily gonna do that. In other words, it's not natural that suddenly we're gonna wake up at just the right time. And I think unfortunately, uh, this is a problem on the left and in the environmental movement. Uh, I think you can gather that from my remarks, uh, I would have a sharp critique of right-wing capitalist approaches to the environmental crises. I would have a sharp critique of mainstream, middle-of-the-road, Democrat capitalist approaches. But I think we also have to realize that what we generally call the environmental movement and the left have also failed. Right? None of the, the left environmental movements that I'm aware of uh, place any of these questions at the center of the conversation. Right? Instead, uh, the left environmental movements are more likely to ignore the questions of size and scale and to grab onto the same technological fundamentalism that the dominant culture does. Hence, you get people who are honestly, but I think very mistakenly, uh, selling what's some called, sometimes called the 100% green energy approach. Well, we're going to have to start realizing pretty soon the limits of alternative energy. We're going to have to understand that no combination of renewable energies, even with advanced technologies that we can hope for in the near future, is going to come anywhere near to providing the, the dense energy that coal, oil, and gas have produced, and let's face it, we now live in a world of almost 8 billion people with an, in, uh, uh, an infrastructure entirely built on that highly dense energy, right? And to say, well, there's a 100% renewable solution when in fact there isn't, is not optimism, it's, uh, I think, foolhardy. And those are the kind of things that Wes and I are trying to put on the agenda. Again, to, to finish off, 
I do not have a binder I can pull off the shelf with the 12 point plan to make all of this work. West doesn't have such a plan. No one has a plan. In fact, if anybody had such a plan and presented it to you, the first thing you can assume is either they're crazy or they're trying to sell you something, right? We have to, to face what I think are problems that have no solutions. If by solutions, we mean solutions that will continue to make it possible for nearly 8 billion people to live with something like the high energy, high technology world that we currently take for granted. That problem has no solution. There is a solution to the question of how do we go forward as a species trying to, through collaboration, cooperation, you know, hold on to the best of our humanity and try to create uh, a soft landing for a society we've built that is not only profoundly unjust, but profoundly unsustainable. And that's what that's the conversation Wes and I hope that we can um, initiate with this book. Uh, and with that, um, wow, I, I intended to, to be brief and I actually stuck to it. I'm proud of myself because as a former professor, you know, the tendency to drone on is an occupational hazard, but I guess I've been retired long enough that I've I've overcome that. So with that, um, I'm happy to take comments, questions, and especially challenges and criticism. And I'll pitch it back to Richard to organize the remainder of our time together. Uh, thank you very much. Before we go to the questions and answers and comments, there's a, some business to take care of first. Um, I'd like to call on Jean to... Um, Tell us about, give us some indication of what future programs are like. Um, Jean, are you there? I think I'm here. That okay. I was, uh, okay. My voice is here, right? Right. But somebody will not let me um, show my face, but that's probably a good thing. Anyway, uh, we do have some excellent programs coming up. Um, we're still working mm -hmm. on them, but uh, we have confirmed for next week, uh, Judy Greenspan who is um, a member of the Workers' World Party. We'll discuss some of these issues and their perspective. Um, uh, but, and she promises to be brief um, and we should have a title and blurb coming soon. Uh, following that, we have Laura Wells, uh, who many of you know is a member of the Green Party. And uh, she's gonna deal with the left unity platform in the California primary in June, uh, because the Peace and Freedom Party and the Green Party have gotten together to run a joint slate. Following that, we have on April 24th, uh, a young Turkish comrade. Uh, and Mehmet's been working on that. And uh, we're still putting that together. Following that, we return to a, another big picture uh, on the abolition of war, uh, anthropological perspectives, which I will be giving on May Day. So um, we have a full program coming up and we've been very good. People have been um, listening, uh, making inquiries. And uh, so we're optimistic about our future. Uh, so anyway, back to you, Richard. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna say a few words about our fundraising. We, we, we do have some expenses and we're inviting, continue to invite people to con contribute financially. Um, I, I, most of you know the, 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 the routine. Uh, I posted some information on um, how to contribute through email, through mail, through PayPal and Patreon on the chat. And that same information is available on our website, icssmarks.org, which you should also check out. And also in, it's on our uh, meeting announcement um, email. So with that, I'd like to turn over the, um, the meeting to the, for the questions. Um, please keep your um, questions and comments brief and so we can get to everybody and um, uh, put your put your hand up through the through the um, 
uh, through the reaction, and I think it's the participants um, tab. I'm, I'm not sure. It's no. the reactions, uh, reactions button the reactions at the bottom. Tab. Yes, I always have to try, and I'll try and call people um, in order that they um, raise their hand. The first person I have is Raj. Please oh, go hi. ahead. Okay, thank you, thank you, Robert. Uh, I share your perspective on the crisis humanity faces. In fact, I spoke twice in this forum um, on the issue, the two, two, there were two series of two talks. And um, the problem is that capitalism is, is geared to more and more production. People don't consume more simply because they want to consume, but rather, they consume more because they're forced to consume. In other words, capitalism creates lifestyle, creates a environment, work situation, all that. So fundamental to overcoming uh, the crisis of ecology, I think it's, it's tied, any, in any case, tied with uh, overthrow of capitalism. Now, but I agree with you, the overthrow of capitalism is not sufficient. I think the there has to be a vision of what kind of life do we want on this planet uh, that, is, that is sustainable as well as rich. So if you can kind of, uh, if you can uh, share your uh, perspective, your vision for that. Uh, and, uh, and if anything, any ideas on how, how we can get there? If uh, I, I know that's just about impossible to, for any single person to do, but I'll appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would say the end of capitalism is a necessary but not sufficient condition for a just and sustainable world. Um, capitalism is, of course, not the only hierarchical, unjust, ecologically destructive system that's ever existed, but it's the one we have to face, and it's the one that is the most destructive. So. It, it's not easy to imagine how we move out of that, especially when there are so many promoting capitalism and the market as the solution to the ecological crisis, so-called green capitalism. Uh, it's very, very disturbing. Wes and I talk about though the, the deeper problem of what we call the temptations of dense energy, right? To recognize that while capitalism promotes unnecessary, gratuitous, uh, even destructive consumption, that is not the only problem. Energy makes life easier in all sorts of ways. The example we use in the book is, since I live out on a property that has well water, uh, if I had a, a problem with my well and had to dig a trench or dig down to get to the pipe, do I wanna do that by hand or would I prefer to hire a backhoe to come in so that the plumber can get at the problem? Well, that, is a tough question because while I might in theory think, well, I should you know, get me and 10 of my friends to, to dig that trench. The fact is uh, a backhoe is a lot easier on your, your back, right? So there are all sorts of uses of energy that are not simply promoted by capitalist um, greed and exploitation. Uh, human beings have tended to use all of the energy available to them, right? And unfortunately, we, we don't always see the consequences, the unintended long-term consequences of using that energy. So it's not going to be simple. But I also think you're absolutely correct that in addition to political struggle to change policy, to change structures, we also have to think about a different way of thinking about what it means to be human. And here I'll quote Wes. You can see that I quote Wes a lot because he's not only a smart guy, but he's got a way with words. And Wes for a while has been promoting what he calls the mill around theory of life. And he puts it in the form of a question. How do we mill around, amuse ourselves, live cheap until we die? Right? In other words, how do we recalibrate our expectations? And in the book, I, I, I write a bit about uh, a conversation I had with Wes. He called me one day. This is a, a kind of story answer to your question. He called me and he was walking around his property in Kansas. He lives on the prairie in Kansas. And as is often the case, he starts not by, hi, how are you? He starts with a bold sentence. He called me and he said, Jensen, why is this not enough? 
And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I'm walking around my property. I'm looking at birds. I'm looking at insects. I'm looking at plants. I am, you know, sitting by the Smoky Hill River and watching a branch go down the, the river. He said, why is this not enough? Why is this not enough for a decent human life? You know, why do we need cruise vacations, Las Vegas, video games, any of that stuff? And of course, the answer is it is enough. And for most of human history, it was more than enough. Right? And so how do we get back to that, I think, is a real question. Um, there's a, a couple of impediments. One, uh, I usually illustrate with a quote from Wallace Stegner, the great Western writer, who talked about the things once possessed that then can't be done without. And we don't have to just point to the 1%, you know, we don't have to point to Jeff Bezos. We just need to look at our own lives and see how the things we once possess then we think can't be done without. It's, it's in all of our lives, okay? That leads to something, I don't know if it's safe to quote George Orwell in a Marxist group, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, Orwell, in an essay after World War II, was talking about the tension in left politics, left international politics, in a place like Britain, where uh, the working class had achieved or would soon achieve a, a certain kind of um, material comfort, which, of course, was based on the exploitation of people around the world. And Orwell said, the problem is, so many times we are fighting against things we really don't want to destroy. Right. Uh, and that's a problem. Right. So I don't have an answer to your question, nor does anybody else. But I do think uh, we have to talk not just about structures, about capitalism, about systems, but we have to talk personally. Right? And this is where it gets uncomfortable because it sounds kind of moralizing and self-congratulatory. But I can tell a story in my own life where I started to finally ask the question, why is this not enough? And I learned what I could give up, right? Now I haven't given up everything that's necessary for a sustainable human future. I still drive a car, I still do all sorts of things that are, you know, in some sense indefensible. But I think if we can start that conversation and, and simply ask, why is this not enough? We can begin. Now I don't, I'm not naive. I don't think that's gonna happen in a time frame that is gonna revolutionize modern society. But I do think that the sooner we ask it and the sooner we're not embarrassed to talk about it, not only what we've done well, but what we failed to do, I think we're better off. That's a long-winded answer because of course I don't have anything constructive to say about your very important but <laughs> difficult questions. And as anybody who's ever been a teacher knows, if you can't answer a question, you just talk till people are sick of listening to you and they let it go. <laughs> so that was my strategy there. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Sharon Rose. You're muted, muted. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have just two comments. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for this presentation and I look forward to, to your book. Um, it's very provoke, provocative in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, one is thank you for talking about the size of populations. So I was in China 12 years ago and I was talking to uh, a professor at Tsinghua University and a, a professor of economics. And he told me that their models and calculations show that by the end of this century, the population of China will be half of what it is today. He, he said it was because of the one child policy. And I was like, I gasped when I heard that. And he said, yes, it's true. And the problem we're grappling with is we're, we're on a path to building infrastructure for 1.4 billion people when we're not gonna need it. So what, but in the meantime, what will we need to sustain life and meet our goals of bringing people out of poverty and all that? All that? So I, I've yeah. told, I came home and told people about that and a lot of, people said to me, oh, that's Malthusian. You don't want to talk about population. That's not the problem. The problem is capitalism or you know, exploitation. But I think that the question of population has a rightful place in our discussion of, of uh, 
the future of humanity. Yeah, yeah. And um, the other comment I have is that I was listening, and I haven't finished listening to it. I was listening to the recording of a webinar that took pe- place among um, European professors, uh, four European professors. Two of them were from Hungary. One was from Germany. I think the other was from Portugal and um, about the collapse of socialism in Eastern Europe. And how do we talk about it? How do we frame it? How do we think about it? And one thing that struck me was one of the people said, um, one problem that the Soviets faced is that basics are not enough. You know, you can get to a point where the population has enough to eat, decent housing, the health care, the basic things that you guarantee to people under socialism, but that's not enough because human beings want to be more than just consumers of the basics. And um, I and, and that was part of her explanation of what, what went wrong in the Soviet Union. And I don't know what I think about that, but and I have to I have to finish listening to the thing, of course. But um, Maybe basics are not enough in terms of um, de- trying to develop a new human being, yeah. but something has to be enough, yeah. as you said. So I uh, thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. Well, just a real quick response. You're right that population continues to be a verboten topic. Uh, a good friend of mine, a, a good leftist who read the manuscript to possibly blurb it, was very upset with what we had to say. He said, if everyone lived at the level of an average Tanzanian, the world could support 8 billion people. And I just had to write him back and say, I don't think that is actually biophysically possible. The other problem of course is that as we raise up the energy and consumption levels of the poorest in the world, uh, that only works if we dramatically lower the consumption of the affluent. And here again, we're not just talking about the 1%, we're talking about all of the, essentially all of the industrial world. Uh, This, even, you know, people of modest means in the United States consume at a level that is not sustainable. So it's easy to point at Jeff Bezos partying on a yacht and wanna hang him up by his heels and slit his throat and let him bleed out. Although I'm a pacifist, don't worry, just kidding. I'm not a pacifist, but I'm not advocating that action against Jeff Bezos, although if any of you wanted to take that action, I probably wouldn't get in the way of it. But back to the subject at hand here. Uh, You know, these are just difficult questions. In addition to the infrastructure problem that we have built a world uh, using incredible amounts of energy for all these people, you have what, you know, demographers would call the dependency ratio. If you slow the birth rate, but don't do anything about slowing or accelerating the death rate, you get an inordinate number of people who are no longer economically productive, like me, right? who are supported by an increasingly small number of people who are. And, and that's not Malthusian, that's just reality. Right? Now, the fact that Malthus was a son of a bitch you know, who didn't care about poor people, the, the fact that a lot of the people who talk about population are fascist, racist, ethnocentric people doesn't mean the question doesn't matter, right? The fact that bad people ask the question and sometimes even good people answer the question badly doesn't mean the question goes away, right? Now, you're right. I, in the book, I just distinguish between basic needs, what I call social needs, and then luxury. So basic needs are you know food, shelter, water, clothing. Social needs are what it takes to live a fulfilling life, which involves some level of human culture. And I count as luxury almost everything that we take for granted in this world, okay? Not just the luxury of the the ultra rich. Well, that luxury consumption is gonna have to end, but social needs are still relevant. Here, I think the important thing is it's all about expectations, right? If your neighbors don't have something, you can't covet it, right? And you can look at societies that did not have high levels of energy, right? Before those energy pools were tapped, who got along just fine on low energy living because there was no, you know, aspiration to anything else because nothing else existed, right? If you look at populations in the industrial world who might offer a model, well, you know, let's take a look at the Amish. 
and I want to make it clear, I'm not promoting the Amish way of life. I'm not a conservative Christian. I'm not a patriarch, right? There's a lot about Amish living I think is very destructive, but because they have a community commitment to a living lower on the energy chain, right? There is not the same kind of temptation and competition and aspiration to something more. Now that's held into place by a religious dogma that I cannot accept. Uh, so the question is, you know, how do we achieve those things without the, the liabilities that come with, you know, a, a kind of conservative approach to social organization and to theology? Uh, I don't have an answer to it, but I think Wes has been a bit of an inspiration to me as a, a person who's lived most of his life in a rural area, you know, coming up in the Great Depression with stories that don't answer the question, but give us a hint. So I would recommend in addition to the book we're talking about uh, and the book I wrote about Wes, Wes recently published a book of stories about his life that illustrates some of this. And the book has what I would argue is the best title in the history of literature. It's called Hogs Are Up. <laughs> and I'm not gonna tell you what the phrase hogs are up means. You have to read the book to figure it out. Um, but that's Wes reflecting on his life as a depression era farm kid, and then a young person in the counterculture movement of the seventies, you know, all of the things where he learned lessons that I think are valuable. Again, I apologize for going on too long. There's a lot of people that want to speak, so I'll shut up. Well, next is uh, Gene Rule. Uh, okay, I, I think I'm on, yeah. Um, well, usually, Oh, thank you so much. This is an excellent talk, really provocative, and uh, I really appreciate it and benefited from it. But I just want to say that when, whenever the uh, discussion turns to environmental problems and pollution and so forth, I always say, don't blame me. I voted for Barry Commoner. And I'm sure you know who Barry Commoner was, one of the founders of uh, sustainable agriculture and this whole approach. And he raised a lot of these questions about how we, you know, live in, in this world. But um, what I wanted to ask or further the discussion is something that uh, uh, Sharon raised, namely um, the role of China. We're also, as you probably know, almost everybody in the room is a socialist of one form or another. And we have a lot of uh, discussions on this topic. And the solution to most of our problems is to be found in socialism. And uh, the leading socialist country for me has always been China. I mean, it is a old, you know, 5,000 years old, very practical, um, and one of the wisest civilizations, if not the wisest. And they've had a world historic revolution that has transformed the lives of all um, Ch Chinese people, but they're also dealing with these issues. They have made the one child policy, which has reduced the population. They're talking about the um, uh, uh, um, uh, ecological civilization, and they're raising a lot of these questions in a very practical way. So I'm sure you'd, uh, I just want to raise that topic and any of your thoughts about how uh, the socialism in China provides uh, a practical path, I think, that we need to take very seriously. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah, there is. Back on the stack. Yeah, there is a, a, a this term ecological civilization you mentioned, I'm familiar with, and I've talked to some of the people in the US who have worked with folks in China. That said, I see nothing in China that's a model for anything, politically, economically, or socially. Uh, but I would say that about every society, virtually every industrial society on the planet. Uh, I'm going to answer the question in a slightly different direction. Uh, we can learn a lot from pre-industrial societies right, that had a different approach to the world right, and the human position in the world. Uh, we can learn a lot from groups in the contemporary world that try to live at a lower level of energy and consumption, right? But none of those are a model for anything. I apologize, the dogs barking in the background will sh stop shortly. Um, 
right? At best, what they offer is, you know, hints at how to think about the human experience. The fact is there is no model to get from 8 billion people in a high energy, high technology society to let's say a population of 2 billion, 3 billion in a lower energy, lower consumption. There is no model for that. And it's almost impossible to imagine doing it without an incredible amount of dislocation and suffering, far more than anything we've ever seen in human. You know, the human experience has a lot of nasty periods in it, right? But I think what we're facing is something unprecedented because of the scale of the change necessary, the time frame in which it must happen, right? Here, I wanna go back to population real quickly. My father was born in 1927, he's still alive. The human population in 1927 was 2 billion people. It has doubled twice in my father's lifetime. There is nothing like that in human history and correcting that is not going to be easy. It was actually in retrospect, fairly easy to ramp up from 2 billion to 8 billion. Largely it's a product of cheap energy, cheap in the kind of uh, superficial sense of it, right? Uh, that cheap energy made it possible to temporarily evade the ecological limits that as an organic creature we face. Right? In other words, every, all of the destruction we're talking about, which has been unfolding for 10,000 years, was ramped up in a, to kind of insane levels only in the last century. Right? There is no model for getting out of this trap. Right? And that's why I think it's so important to start talking honestly, because as long as we kid ourselves about 100% renewable energy and other such things, we're going to make no progress. In fact, we're just going to keep digging the hole deeper. Thank you. Next is Mehmet. Please uh, unmute. About that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, very good presentation. And uh, two points I'd like to uh, ask. One is, have we crossed the threshold? I mean, looking at the things just in the past couple of months alone, it looks like we've gone to uh, a level where, if not impossible, it's going to be very, very hard to come back to, number one. But in order to do that, you you very uh, you know well put this uh, uh, situation is that it is going to be very hard for the first world if we were to divide the world in a Maoistic terms first second third uh, it's uh, uh, it will have to start from there because I am not going to go to a Chinese peasant or a Turkish peasant whose only dream is to get a refrigerator so that their uh, food doesn't rot every two to three days and tell them to be responsible and not to buy a refrigerator while the first world has three refrigerators in their homes. So how are we going to, first of all, uh, have the people in the metropolitan countries accept that this is not sustainable and to accept to lose everything they have to be able to bring the world to the planet to a sustainable level. The second thing is, how are we going to change the dreams and aspirations of people who in, let's say the second world or the, you know, the, again, in the third world, who think that the only way to live a good life is to buy a car, to buy a refrigerator. But we must also remember that if we are going to raise the quality of life for anybody, that means that you don't die at the age of 35. You don't uh, get sick when you are a kid. There needs to be a technology that develops vaccines, that develops, I don't know, better care and so on and so forth. But that doesn't, uh, that technology doesn't grow in vacuum. All technologies around feed each other. I mean, I hate to give this example, but 
you know, internet that we are using today was developed by the army. Many technologies today used in the civilian life for the betterment of people, unfortunately came through either the military or the, uh, you know, wars and so on and so forth. You, you very rightly said, you know, the uh, mother of invention. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but to change this requires a whole lot of changes that the powers be will not allow in the capital world. That's why I think people before me, Raj and Jean, were saying that the solution comes through socialism. So without that, I'm not so sure how we can get to the point that we all agree here that, and you are putting out there. Thank you. Oh, one thing, one more thing. It, the studies have shown that if people have more security in their lives, they tend to make less children. So security, if we can provide that, I think then we will achieve what you are saying. You know, less children uh, without killing the elderly uh, will, uh, will bring down the population to a certain level. And I agree 100% with that. But uh, in order to do that, we have to give them security, which the capitalist system is unable to do. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to deal with capitalism first as a first step to be able to bring other solutions. Sorry it took longer. No, Thank you. No, uh, all important points, and I agree. Uh, as far as threshold, on, there's a, a group in Stockholm, the Stockholm Resilience Center, that has this sketch of planetary boundaries, some of which we've already crossed. Um, I do think we have to recognize uh, there's too much water going through the turbines. I mean, there are ways that we will never be able to recover. And that's just the, the reality. Um, you know, I'm a materialist. I think material realities matter. Um, and it, it, unless we want to double down on this technological fundamentalism, we have to start coping with that. Um, I also agree that the most important thing is, of course, not to preach to the third world about why they should stay poor, but to take actions in the first world. And this is where I think personal choices matter, um, although I'm hesitant about saying that, because if people in the first world choose to live more frugally, that alone is not going to solve the ecological crises. But it does demonstrate that there is a different way to live, and those of us in the first world are willing to sacrifice some things. Here, I'm going to um, plug another one of my books, uh, because it's a, a kind of thing that is answered better in story. I had a friend named Jim Copland. None of you would know him. Uh, he was a dear person to a large circle of friends and comrades, but not a public person. And he's the person who radicalized me uh, many, many years ago. He's now dead. Uh, and I wrote a book about Jim called Plain Radical. He was a Minnesota farm boy turned revolutionary, um, you know, radical, socialist, anti-racist. He was um, part of the, all the movements, the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement and the environmental movement. And he lived in a very plain way, hence the title, he was a plain radical. And Jim, because of his roots in a depression era farm, understood how you could live a meaningful life without that level of capitalist consumption. And more than anyone I ever met who lived in a city, you know, and still had a house that was heated with fossil fuels, he demonstrated that. And Jim didn't go around tooting his own horn, you know, uh, taking out ads in the New York Times about how frugal he was. He simply lived those values. And because he was such a warm and generous person, there were literally now, there's hundreds of people in what I call the circles of Copland who were changed by that. And that's a small, but I think important part of it, right? Um, how do we change our dreams? We're back to something we've, we've come around to many times. Uh, we have to be able to imagine what it means to live not only outside capitalism, but outside the industrial system as well. And it's not easy, but we keep trying. I don't have anything uh, more insightful to say than I tried earlier. So I'll, I'll turn it over to the next person. Next person is Janet Coburn. Go ahead, Janet, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, for this presentation. Um, 
I have, I don't know, a number of sort of random thoughts and mm -hmm. questions. Uh, uh, I, I think about uh, humans um, thinking highly of them, you know, too highly of, of humans. You know, it's mm -hmm. like a uh, uh, whole thing of human centricity and uh, um, overestimating their position in evolution and um, I'm wondering if you have considered humans as a failed evolutionary species. Uh, that's one thought. Um, in terms of size, um, certainly war and especially nuclear war uh, if, uh, and pandemics are ways to reduce the number of humans. So I don't know whether that's planned in some way. Um, and in terms of speed, um, with things deteriorating as they have been, um, to try to uh, get to a point of socialism, would there be enough time? I mean, yeah, we've been trying to um, get to socialism for um, centuries, and it's uh, we're uh, not getting there. Um, and then finally. Um, I'm wondering, regarding people being willing to live with less, um, is comfort and convenience something that's fundamental to human beings? I'll stop there. Uh, I was reminded not to be glib about it when you were talking about human, the human supremacy problem, which of course is not true of every culture and every moment in human history, but is certainly dominant today. I think it was the biologist Ernst Mayer who said that um, the problem is probably intelligence, that intelligence is a lethal mutation, that any species, any organism that becomes as intelligent as we are is bound to destroy itself. And I think, I'm doing this from memory, he said that, if he was the one who said it, in reaction to the question of why don't we see other civilizations on other planets? And he said, as well, it's probably because intelligence is a lethal mutation. And any species that gets to the point where it could travel or communicate interplanetarily um, would destroy itself. And I, I don't mean to be glib because I think there's something to that, perhaps. We do overestimate. In the book, Wes and I um, distinguish between a view that we are animals or the view that we are animals plus. And Wes and I are, are squarely in the camp that we are animals. And by animals plus, the most obvious one is, is a religious conception that says we are a product of divine creation. We have a soul that's non-material and we're close to God. Okay, that's a conception of us as animals plus. But there's a lot of secular versions of it. A lot of it you see in the debate over free will, this idea that somehow, somewhere, yes, we're animals. Yes, we have an evolutionary history that predisposes us to certain things. Yes, we have species propensities, but we're different somehow. And I think that's one of the most important turns I've made in my life. We are not different. And here I wanna go back to that question of the temptations of dense energy, right? It's very hard. There have been some cases of human societies and human beings rejecting those temptations, but by far the dominant pattern is human beings acquiring all energy available to them and using it to create material comfort, right? And you can say, well, it shouldn't be that way, but if that's the way it is, we have to cope with it, right? And when people say, well, what about, you know, indigenous societies that didn't do that? Well, let's look at the level of technology and energy available to them, right? And that's not a way of, you know, undermining or dismissing the insights of those cultures. It's a way of recognizing that we really are one species. I have what I would call a deep anti-racist principle that's behind this book, which is that the human species is one. Right? The superficial differences in humanity right, are not a product of evolution. They're a product of geography, mainly, right? the different ways we live. And that means um, we, shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be cocky. Right? If, if one is from a culture or a community that lives at a lower level of energy consumption, that's fine, though the rest of us should learn from it. But uh, I think my favorite sentence in the book is one that I've really taken to heart in recent years. 
the moral high ground is a dangerous place to stand, even when it's warranted. So even when we think we have made moral choices that are not only defensible, but admirable, and I think, you know, we can do that, we should be very careful about the problem of arrogance and haughtiness, right? Now, we know that Europe was arrogant and haughty in the way it rampaged around the world, claiming to be superior. But any claim to superiority to me is dangerous. And it undermines that, what I would call that deep anti-racist principle that we are one species and we all struggle with the same things. Um, that's not a really direct answer to your question, I suspect, but um, that was immediately what I was thinking as you were talking. Next is Mark Anderson. Please unmute yourself. <clears throat> unmute yourself, yeah. Mark. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, Robert, it was a good presentation, and it, it is provocative, which uh, I which which I think is a which I think is a positive. But I want to ask you if you and Wes took the time during your research to uh, to to uh, to try to answer the the stark and most pronounced uh, effect that war had on the environment. Especially when, especially with the ev evolution of the the industrial revolution, and and when you get into uh, levé en masse, the conscripting of entire populations and economies for war, beginning in 1793 with Lazare Carnot, and this is going to dominate war up till September 2nd, 1945. So I was wondering if 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 you or Wes did some research or a lot of research on this. Uh the answer is, is no in the sense that it's not reflected in the book, although uh, what you say is incredibly important and has been on my mind a long time. My original sort of activist life came in the what we used to call either the anti-war or the anti-empire movement. Mm, uh, right. the, the need to constrain the US, you know, for us, for me, given my age, this all started in the 1990s. Um, and so I think a lot about what you're saying. Uh, it reminds me of the, the. I hate to say it because I, I don't know how people feel about it, but Steven Pinker's book about how, oh, we're much better off in in this century, you know, uh, much more, much less lethal, uh, and saying that in the context of, the modern way of waging war, always struck me as kind of obscene, uh, that yeah. in, adi in addition to the raw number of people killed. The amount of resources that are marshaled and the way social organizations uh, uh, indoctrinate people into this acceptance of what is only insanity, there's no other way to label it, um, is part of the tra tragedy of the modern human. And of course, when you add nuclear weapons, the existential threat um, just takes it to a new level. We didn't write about this in part I suspect because we didn't know what we could say about it um, that hasn't been said better by others. And I would only um, comment further um, my emotional reaction to your question was one of deep sadness. You threw me into a really dark place really quickly. And I'm not upset about that. I'm just recognizing that that weighs heavy on me and I think on many people. Um, the, the institutionalized brutality of modern warfare and how it's become background noise. Uh, there's something deeply sad about that and I don't have a good way to sort this out right now. I'm just kind of reacting. Uh, I think we're seeing it in the Ukraine uh, conflict. Uh, of course, much of America hasn't been paying attention to the destruction of you know, Latin America, the Middle East, Yemen, you know, Right. It's not that Ukraine is unique. It's that we're paying attention to it. And several times people have said to me, they've been deeply affected by the, the reports from Ukraine. And I say, yeah, that's what happened to me when I got radicalized and started reading about the U.S. assault on Iraq starting in 1991 and the devastation, the destruction, the murder, the barbarity of it all. I yeah. said, I, 
I have lived with this, you know, for 30 years. And of course, many people on this call have lived with it far longer than that. And I don't have anything more intelligent to say other than uh, you made me want to cry. So thank you. That's a good well, thing. I've, 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 I've given a talk on this topic and yeah. it's called Making War on Mother Nature. Yeah. And I what mean, man does with his ability to produce and his ability to, to invent yeah. and how that's affected war. Yeah. Uh, it's just absolutely fascinating. Distressingly yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, not to go on, but um, I remember reading in one of the papers that the Russians are so barbaric that they're using fuel air explosives and cluster yeah. munitions. Right. And of course, everybody who's dared to say that to me, I want to say, OK, do you want to talk about U.S. use of fuel air explosives in the 91 Gulf War? You want to talk about the cluster munitions the United States have been using since right. Vietnam? You know, the barbarism is not unique to any particular warring society these days. Uh, right. Sad to say. Okay, I'll shut up because now I'm just ranting. No, thank you very much. Okay, the next is Michael K. Please unmute yourself. Oh, hi. This is Susan, actually. Um, I couldn't change my name. I have a few questions. One, one of them is very short, and I'd like to ask it first and then go to the others. What is the name of the Stockholm group that you mentioned? I believe it's the Stockholm Resilience Center. Okay. They're wide, and they've got a website about planet. Just search for planetary boundaries, and it'll come up quickly. Okay. So um, I'm in a very dark place right now as a result of this discussion. Thank you. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with you, um, but my uh, I'll ask my other questions together. Um, there's, I, I've been engaged in discussions about the degrowth movement versus, versus, in some ways, socialism with better distribution and decision, you know, decisions about produ what to produce, what not to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I wonder if, you know, what, whether you consider yourself part of that. And my second question is that uh, it's not a question, uh, it's a request. Um, I am involved in several organizations that are advocating for 100% renewable energy. And I would like to hear more uh, about why that's impossible, bad, whatever. Um, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh so over the years, there's been discussion of steady state economics. As you pointed out, the degrowth movement is very uh, popular these days in certain circles. Uh, Kate Rayworth had a book called Donut Economics. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of agnostic on all these things, partly because I'm not smart enough to understand what the best path forward is. Uh, in the book, Wes, reduce all of, Wes and I reduce this to a bumper sticker, fewer and less fewer people consuming less. Now, I don't think in the time frame available, there's going to be a planned transition. I, I think the coming decades are gonna be ugly in a lot of ways. But as long as people are saying, we need to consume less, we need to deal with the question of population, people will have different ideas for how to get there. And, and I'm, you know, kind of let a hundred flowers bloom at this point, until we have a clear idea of a path that will work uh, I'm willing to listen to anybody. And I have friends who hold all of these positions, sometimes mutually exclusive with other friends, they argue, and I just try to, to, to embrace it all. Uh, on the question of 100% renewable, uh, there's a big debate on this. I don't wanna pretend this is obvious. Uh, here, I would recommend the work of my friend and colleague, Stan Cox. Stan is a plant breeder and longtime socialist. He works at the Land Institute and for a long time was their lead sorghum breeder. Uh, he's one of the smartest people I know personally. And he shifted away from the science now to uh, social criticism and commentary. He's got a couple of new books from City Lights. And Stan has run the numbers with an expertise I am incapable of uh, to point out that, that the 100% renewable promise is simply inadequate. If by that we mean we're going to maintain anything like the existing infrastructure. 
Now, human beings can live on 100% renewable energy, of course, just not like we live today, right? At, you know, for most of human history, we lived with 100% renewable energy. We lived in what Les West calls a sunshine economy, right? And it's gonna be a sunshine future, right? It's just that how we get there is hard to imagine. One of the things Stan points out very, uh, I think, importantly, is that if all we do is promote renewable energy, right? There's no guarantee. In fact, there's no reason to think it's going to end fossil fuel use. That what has been so far the, the, the pattern is that renewable energy is then added on top of existing energy sources. So Stan and his colleague, uh, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment, uh, have come up with what a strategy for capping energy use. So it's not just more renewables, it's got to be a policy cap. And they call their strategy cap and adapt. And I think it's a, a very important one. So I don't want to dump on renewable energies. We're here trying to figure out how to install solar panels on our home. Uh, obviously, there's no future without some renewable energy sources. It's the unwarranted optimism. All right, so let's take a quick example, electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are not gonna be part of a sustainable future, right? Because electric vehicles are not, are not carbon neutral. You cannot produce an electric vehicle without an extractive economy for the, for the metals and other components of that vehicle, right? You can't make batteries that are net zero, right? So we just have to give up these illusions. It doesn't mean we shouldn't invest in more electric vehicles to replace diesel and gas burning engines. It just means the overall goal is a lot fewer cars, right? And the, the, the ease at which people of conscience, people I consider good friends and committed activists, grab onto this 100% renewable or electric vehicles, I find um, a little disturbing. We have to be a little harder on ourselves, I think. Okay, next uh, is Norma. Unmute yourself, please. Norma Harrison, unmute yourself. All right, you muted me back again. Yes, leave me alone. Um, hi. Uh, I don't have any questions. You answered them all. In fact, you answered them before you even began speaking because we all know all this stuff that you're telling us. It's lovely to hear it from your standpoint. Um, I put a note into the chat about an experience I had a long time ago that I think is informative. I'll summarize it maybe here. Uh, when I was teaching at Robert Taylor Homes, Robert Taylor Homes, 13 story tall buildings, about a, three, a quarter of a mile long, about uh, uh, about three quarters of a mile long, about a quarter mile wide. Uh, I forget how many buildings there were supposed to, they were supposed to be housing 27,000 people in these uh, buildings people who had been impoverished by our system mm -hmm. of uh, being black and uh, being slaves, well, at a lower level than I was as a school teacher. <laughs> uh, they inter there was an article in the paper, a report, a review, of somebody uh, interviewing people there at Robert Taylor Homes and he got to a person who had 12 children who said that, yes, she would like to have another because that's the only time she feels good, which makes perfect sense to me. Uh, not that I ever <laughs> aspired, but the, uh, having a child is, is really a good feeling to do. Uh, those homes, they tore them down and instead of instead of rebuilding them, I mean, they kicked everybody out. And instead of re rehabbing them into larger, more sufficient, more attractive, sturdier units, they tore the buildings down. It was called urban removal. Yeah. So just, just the anguish of how this system that we live in works, what the mentality is. And, and these are just people who are 
trying hard in political methods to uh, achieve uh, positions of acknowledgement that they should be doing those positions and they never should and we should not and uh, your descriptions and your discussion and I, I put up a, a link to uh, an older connection you have on the internet, which is a very lovely link. If people want to look at that link and read it. Thank you. Any comment? Yeah, just really quickly. I think the word anguish you used is very important. Uh, I used that term in a recent piece I published called a practical radical politics. Uh, to acknowledge the anguish. You said everybody knows this. I'm not sure I agree. A lot of people don't. But uh, the the I always say I never tell any people anything new. I just say it out loud. And you can't deal with anguish alone. Right? These are our emotions, the grief we're talking about, the dark place we can get in. If you're trapped by yourself there, you're lost. And that's part of the reason I want to talk about this so much, even though people say it's depressing, is because I want to share that sense of anguish. And I think that's really important. Uh, I belong to Communist Party, Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism, mm -hmm. Peace and Freedom Party. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for mishpacha. You know what that is? No, you have to translate. Mishpacha is uh, Yiddish for family. Yeah. And I think we're all looking for that. There's a lot of other things yeah. that come to mind. I've been talking too much. So instead of just running my mouth, I'm going to shut up. There's a lot of people in the stack. Well. We're very interested in hearing your views, Robert. Uh, our next questioner is Laura, who is our, who incidentally is our speaker in two weeks. So go ahead, Laura. Well, hi. Um, thank you. I have a question. When you said it, it isn't just a crisis of consumption. Did you say of uh, it's a crisis of consumption and meaning? Yeah, in the introduction to the book. We talk about the obvious crisis of consumption. Okay, uh, just this moment, I got a call. Can I uh, yeah, come sure. back in just a, for the next one? Go ahead. And we'll go on to the next uh, next questioner, which is on the phone three three eight two eight four one. I think it's Richard. Rich yeah. Johnson, go ahead. Yeah, you are unmuted, Rich. Good. Uh, go ahead, uh, or Kit. Well, he obviously is not. Hello. Yeah, you're Hello. on, Rich. You're on. Okay, uh, Kit's going to speak. I'll lower my hand when she speaks. If I put it back up, that'll be me. But Kit's on right now. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, uh, for speaking. I totally agree with so much that you've been talking about. I agree that humans are an arrogant species out of touch with uh, nature and living out of context. Uh, we are animals and we forget that a lot. Um, I received an email yesterday that uh, 65 million years ago, an asteroid killed 75% of uh, Earth. And today, we're the asteroid where humanity's destroyed two-thirds of the world's rainforest, half the coral reefs, 87% of the wetlands. And this is just a snippet of our own destruction. Um, and we're currently undergoing the next great extinction, as you know. Um, I think in August, at the end of August, there's going to be... Can you hear? What was that? Um, there's going to be uh, talks with the governments, um, about the environment. And so we have 150 days to uh, tell our leaders to follow the science and to agree to protect half the planet at least. But more than 50 governments have agreed to protect only 30% of the planet by 2030. And we know that this is inadequate. And 2030 is only eight years away. We've been warned for a very long time, decades ago, about the consequences of ignoring the warnings um, that the environment has been telling us. Um, I believe that we need to pull back as a, as a society. We need to, uh, you know, we need to push for the reduction of our work hours and our workday. Um, 
I know that in the county where I live, Alameda County, the employees were surveyed about what to do uh, to reduce energy consumption and to use renewable resources. You know, they're pushing on this technology thing. The problem is that we're being pushed to use more computers. Uh, we live in a 24-7 hour world uh, that doesn't allow us to rest. We have to get away from this. We have to advocate for the reduction of our work hours. Um, I think that's a solution right there that I think people are ready for. Right now, the, um, you know, the whole COVID situation has caused people to rethink um, what remote working means, and they've been pushing for shorter work, a shorter work week, but they're not pushing for a shorter, um, no, they've been pushing they're not pushing for less than 40 hours. That's the problem right there. We don't allow ourselves as a species to rest. Um, we used to. We used to do that, and it used to be very good for us. But we have a sleep deprivation problem, and the technology contributes to this. Uh, we need. I think that's one of the biggest solutions. We need to pull back. We need to force people not to work. COVID showed us that we can do this. Uh, we've been able to reduce automobile use at the beginning are, are of the you, pandemic. And are you watching use. the movie? Okay, kid, no. Yeah, kids, what happened? Uh, I, I was okay, can, I, can I be heard? I could watch okay. the movie. Okay, um, I'm being interrupted um, here. They're not hey. showing the movie today? They're showing the movie anytime. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Hello? And there is a panel. Uh, Hello? Uh, kids, uh, could oh. you wind up? And state your question if you have one. Okay, well, um, I don't have a question, but I'm offering this as a solution. Our Protestant work ethic isn't working for us. And okay. I really think we need to push our government officials to reduce our work hours. And this is one of the things I think uh, as you know, socialists and communists that we can do, we should do. Thank you. Um, I'm just, I'm going to insert a, a question of my own. Um, there's a lot of buzz on the internet about the Great Reset coming out of the World Economic Forum. And it sounds a little superficially like what you're proposing or what you're, I wonder if you have any comment about that, that, that um, line of thinking, Robert. Uh, you'd have to say more about what the Great Reset means in this concept context. Well, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. It's it's apparently a, a series of ideas coming out of the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab was the head of it, and it's associated. It's allegedly associated with Bill Gates and similar similar uh, global um, billionaires that. Um, it pr proposes many of the, I, I don't know as much about it, oh. um, very much about it beyond that. Yeah. You know, cutting back, we have to live, no, no property. People, people, of course, people are concerned about they're gonna have no property. Everything's gonna be a shared economy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, now I'm, I'm reminded of what you're talking about. And I, I, I don't think it has any of those radical implications. Coming out of the World Economic Forum with the endorsement of people like Gates would suggest it's a kind of kindler and gentler capitalism. Uh, and I think everybody in this forum would agree a, a kinder and gentler form of slavery is still slavery. Uh, you know, the idea that we can kind of finesse our way out of this uh, I think is just a failed project and we need to be honest about what the, the degree and depth of change necessary. Even if we can't accomplish it, it's better. Even if we can't accomplish it, it's better to talk honestly than to fool ourselves. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, going back to Laura Wells, who finished a question. Could you repeat your beginning of your question? Yeah, it, it was um, whether, and, and somebody came just this precise time. Uh, anyway. A crisis of consumption and meaning, is that what, what you said, uh, Robert? Yeah. Okay, um, so I'll come back to that, but the I wanted to, and I'll probably put them in the chat, I've just read The Ministry of the Future 
-hmm. by Kim Stanley Robinson. And that's an interesting book to read. He talks about, oh, he, he has no prescription for what to do, but he talks about in the near future, it's science fiction near future, about a whole lot of things that people are likely to do in the coming times. It's very interesting. Um, also, I just saw a documentary last night, Once You Know, it was 2020. Um, and it's about once you know that we've gone too far, you know, sort of what do you do then? Um, and an old book that I like from the 70s that was about the Ladakh, was, which was Ancient Futures by Helena Norberg Hodge, which talked about a traditional culture that within a very short time frame, 25 years, went to uh, a more, more industrialized, you know, like a modern Western kind of culture in the Ladakh region of the Himalayas. But so my question is about the consumption and meaning. And I know um, that I wondered what, what you think about as meaning. If it's not, I know religion, do you see religion as different from spirit? Do you think people have a spirit, um, if not a soul? And I'm, you know, all, all of that, I just sort of what, what do you, uh, I think meaning is extremely important, and I'm I'm curious what you, uh, how you see it. Yeah, so we talk right at the beginning of the book about the crisis of consumption, too many people consuming too much, and the crisis of meaning is that collectively, we have not come up with an answer to the question of what does it mean to be human, that is adequate to deal with the consumption the consumption crisis. Right now, that doesn't mean individual people or or specific cultures don't have deep and rich systems of meaning, right? What we're talking about is a collective human understanding of what it means to be human that is that we can use to mobilize to change in a time frame that we need to, all right? Now, does that have to be religious? Uh, I am not a religious person, nor is Wes. Sometimes people say, well, I'm spiritual, not religious. I say, I'm not spiritual either. I, Wes and I would both say, we don't really know what the term spiritual is trying to name, right? We are materialists in a traditional sense. And that doesn't mean there's no meaning in the world. It just means that meaning is constructed by us. And so this is the, the task. Let me sort of jump to answer your question by talking about another part of the book uh, where we talk about a saving remnant. What, what do we need to do to prepare so that there is some remnant of the human population that can not only survive, but thrive. And we talk about three things, the skills, the spaces, and the stories that we need to create a sustainable world with that meaning. By skills, we mean low energy skills. You know, most of the people in the industrial world wouldn't know how to survive for more than about, you know, a week if the power went off, right? There's a whole bunch of low energy skills from a sunshine economy that we need to be teaching ourselves. And you see this happening all over the place. The surge in interest in gardening is a good example of it, okay. Spaces, right? We need to have more communal and collective spaces that we come together. You know, a church is the most obvious example of it. I always say the most important thing about church is not the doctrine or the dogma. It's the fact that you know where to go every Saturday. Uh, for me, it would have been every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., right? You have a space in which it's okay to ask questions about what it means to be human. I think that's the most important thing about a church, a mosque, a temple, synagogue, anything, right? It's not the dogma, it's the coming together, right? Now that's not the only way you can bring people together, a union hall, a communist party meeting, any number of things can do that, but we have to create those spaces. But to answer your question, stories, the stories we have today are inadequate for a sustainable human future. Stories that glorify war, stories that glorify celebrities, you know, stories about getting rich. A lot of the stories, including stories about human ingenuity, are simply going to have to be retold. And here I think it's a combination of drawing on old stories that still contain the best of human wisdom, some of which are religious, and creating new stories. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson is a good example. Um, I couldn't get through Ministry of the Future. It was too tedious for me. I gave up about 200 pages in. But that said, he's trying to do that, and I admire him for it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work in, in the arts right now to imagine a different future. And 
Wes, you know, Wes is a biologist, a botanist, and a geneticist. And he is the biggest advocate of the arts, not because he's a, you know, sophisticated guy, but because he sees that as a source of imagination. And in fact, uh, Wes has what he calls his art without ego project, which I'm gonna describe not to go into too much detail because I think it speaks to your question. Wes loves to collect things in, in the forest, things in the prairie and turn them into art with virtually no human intervention. Uh, his art without ego project started when he would, he has a, a sawmill at home and he would plane a, an ash tree that was being destroyed by the ash borer, which is a, an insect that eats the tree from the inside. And he started to realize there were these beautiful patterns that the ash borer left when he would plane a, an ash tree. And so he would cover it with oil and then put it up on the wall and say, this is art without ego. Look at this beautiful design created by an ash borer. All right, so not to go on too long, but looking for meaning, looking for inspiration in the world around us, rather than in this valorizing of human creativity. Wes has another example. He says, it's a thought experiment. He said, if you had a, a, an acre of unplowed prairie, native prairie, and you had the Mona Lisa, the original Mona Lisa, and somebody gave you a, a choice, you can either burn the Mona Lisa or plow that prairie. Wes says, burn the Mona Lisa. Who cares? <laughs> he said, an acre of unplowed prairie includes more creativity than the Mona Lisa, right? It's just a way of recalculating, recalibrating us. Uh, and I'll, I won't go on any longer, but I think because I didn't have a very specific response, those are the kind of things that came to mind. All right, thank you. Just to summarize, we're, we're about, 20 minutes from um, um, ending the formal part of our program. And there's three, three more questioners on the first round. Maybe we'll get into the second round, but you know, uh, please keep your uh, questions brief. Uh, the next questioner is Richard Wright from Austin. Uh, hey there, uh, Brother Bob. Uh, for those who don't know, we were both in Texas State Employees Union. Uh, so as I was listening to your presentation, uh, there are a bunch of things that were going through my head. One was that uh, I kept uh, going back to uh, uh, small is beautiful, um, you know, the population bomb, uh, 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 the, the latest thing I is... Uh, Hari uh, uh, Homo sapiens. Um, the other thing that uh, that was going through my head is I had uh, I, I I've been to the farm, for example, in Tennessee, and, and I, uh, uh, I I I I had conversations with Helen and Scott Nearing, and I grew up in a farm uh, or a small farm um, in Maine, and um, um, and I, I've, I've been. Anyways, the thing that struck me is most of these things are failures. Um, and, you know, and, and I go back to my, I go back to my organizing roots and I keep, you know, uh, uh, thinking that you don't approach people by saying how, how bad things are. You've got to, you've got to give them something to, to want to, to, to join an organization. And actually you haven't even really addressed uh, the need for political organization. Uh, everything you've talked about is, is some variation, I think, of, of more or less inner spirituality. Um, uh, there's that. And the other thing is, is well, how do you address the likes of a, a Jai Bolsonaro, uh, you know, who, uh, you know, is beholden to uh, a capitalist, uh, and, uh, you know, and we're witnessing a, a tremendous destruction of the Amazon, uh, you know, and he doesn't give a damn about, uh, uh, you know, anything as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Uh, well, as Wes and I try to emphasize over and over again, this is not a question of either political organizing versus some sort of spiritual transformation. It's a big soup, it goes forward together. The reason 
I haven't focused on organizing, although I've been part of many organizing efforts over the last 30 years in feminism, in anti-war activities, in anti-capitalist activities. I was part of the worker cooperative movement in Austin uh, for a number of years, um, uh, immigrant worker justice. I'm not saying don't get involved in politics. Right? I'm saying that if we're gonna get involved in politics, we have to tell the truth about the material realities that we're up against. Right? And yes, you can't build an organization quickly by telling people, here's how bad things are. Right? On the other hand, it doesn't seem to me very fruitful to base organizing strategies on a denial of material reality, right? So we're stuck, but I'm not proposing solutions because I think the first step is to recognize what we can't accomplish before we decide what we want to accomplish. And right now, the left and most of the environmental movement, it strikes me as delusional, right? And so in a sense, this is a book that tries to break the delusion and tell the truth about where we're at. Now, sometimes people say, and, and this is in the book, well, I agree with you, but people can't handle it, right? I've, I've heard that more times than I can count. People can't handle this. And whenever somebody tells me people can't handle it, what I assume they are saying is I can't handle it, right? And the truth is nobody can handle this, right? The reality of the current human predicament is beyond anybody's capacity to handle. The one thing I know is if you try to handle it alone, you're lost. If you have a place to come together to try to work through it, then there's a hope. Uh, at the risk of going on too long, there's a great James Baldwin quote I've used many times. It comes from a, an essay in the early 60s. And he's talking about the role of artists, specifically writers in this case, and specifically about challenging white supremacy. He said, the, the role of an artist is to tell as much of the truth as you can bear, and then a little more. Right? And in the book, we say, we want to take it one step further, right? To tell as much of the truth as you can bear, and then a little more, and then all of the rest of the truth, whether you can bear it or not. Because the truth is, nobody can bear this, right? And that's been under a kind of undercurrent of this whole conversation, right? But I believe, based on my own experience um, in various movements for 30 years, that we have to start telling the truth to each other and trying to bear it. And from that will come creativity that we currently don't have at our disposal. I do know that a lot of old organizing strategies are failed and I think we need to leave them behind. I don't have a playbook for the new you know, strategy. I wish I did. I often wish I was a lot smarter than I am. So that's not a rebuttal of what you said so much as um, an explanation for why I'm doing what I'm doing now after a long, you know, 30 years in movement politics that were more traditional. Uh, the next questioner is Yusuf, oh no, sorry, Gulden followed by Yusuf. And they'll be the first, last first round questioners. Gulden first. Hi, thank you very much, Chair. Professor Dick Jansen, uh, it was really, very really informative. Um, I have, uh, <clears throat> some of my comrades actually brought up uh, these uh, questions uh, earlier, but I'm still not convinced on some issues. I pulled up uh, some of the, uh, um, uh, some uh, statistics, like for example, wealthy is 0.54% of the population about 40 million people are responsible for 14% of uh, greenhouse gas, em gas emissions and carbon, carbon footprints, as opposed to the bottom 50% of the income earners, almost 4 billion people only emit around 10%. Uh, so by looking at these uh, statistics uh, like how can we still say that size is the big problem? You know, it's obvious that for, by looking at the statistics, it's obvious that climate change is directly linked to the economic inequality. Uh, so th that's, I'm, I mean, what's your explanation is the number one S is the size. And the second question of mine is, uh, can we add another S to your four S's? 
like system. Thank you. Yeah. Uh just one corrective, if I wasn't clear, I didn't say the number one question was size. The number one question is the size of the human population at what level of consumption. Now, it's obviously true that the, the wealthiest take, whether you want the one 10 percent, top 20 percent, are responsible for the vast majority of not only climate change and emissions, but I want to always go back to ecological degradation, right? because climate change is only one problem. Right. Those other problems are equally important. If we could magically solve the climate problem today, we would still be on the brink of collapse. Right. So that's important. The point that Wes and I are making is that if you were to equalize the distribution of wealth, right, you would still have the problem of a human population whose aggregate consumption is not sustainable. We have passed the carrying capacity of the planet. Right. Now, the only reason that that's not already collapsing the ecosystems of the world completely is because of the short term you know energy of fossil fuels right? that we've we've evaded the biolog the biophysical limits of the planet but only in a temporary sense right so if you were to to somehow through political and social change eliminate the most gratuitous consumption of the wealthiest we would still be facing roughly the same ecological crisis. And that's what I think we have to go. So I think as several of us have said, the end of capitalism, the end of the insane consumption of a growth oriented, profit oriented world is a necessary but not sufficient condition because you've still got left when you eliminate that system, the temptations of dense energy, which are not a product of a capitalist conspiracy, they're a product of biology. They're a reality about human nature. And here, not to go on too long again, but you know, because capitalism has distorted human nature and tried to persuade people that human nature is nothing but greed and material self-interest, right? The left has too long, I think, wanted to pretend there is nothing called human nature that's relevant, but human nature is relevant, just like it's relevant in assessing the status of any other organism. There is something called human nature. It's widely variable and plastic. It includes the capacity for collaboration and cooperation, which is what made us the dominant species on the planet. And it also includes the capacity for greed and destruction, right? So human nature is relevant, but part of our nature is also not just in that social sense, but human, what we call human carbon nature, right? The struggle for energy rich carbon is part of the live the experience of life on this planet and we're no different. So I don't want to undermine the attempt to, to challenge the consumption of the wealthy. I want to say what comes after that. Thank you. And our last first round speaker is Yusuf. Please, uh, please, yeah. Please unmute yourself, Yusuf. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, step in as a physicist and say 100% um, renewable energy is just uh, impossible. Uh, even the sun, the sun is an extremely wasteful uh, uh, system, actually. Uh, but fortunately, uh, um, we won't have to deal with that for a very, very long time. Um, Second, I do believe that um, there is such a thing as um, a, a unnecessary consumption generated mostly by capitalism and uh, a, a, a consumption um, uh, uh, that uh, is uh, the, that people uh, would like, such as this, um, uh, the internet, the computer we are using, but uh, I, I, having to have an iPhone, new iPhone every year is uh, uh, something generated by capitalism. Uh, uh, just uh, get a efficient uh, phone uh, and stick with it. Uh, so, so maybe you could uh, 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 elaborate on that. 
I'm not sure what to elaborate on, but to agree that the ex the worst excesses of contemporary consumption are a product of the propaganda of advertising marketing yoked to a profit oriented growth economy. But again, not to be a broken record, uh, some of the human use of energy is not simply about capitalist propaganda. It's about the material comfort that comes from it. And that's a reality. That's not a distortion of human nature. That's simply part of human nature. Right? Uh, we have to remember that capitalism wouldn't work if it didn't play to a real part of human nature. Right? Uh, other societies have had ways to control the worst of our instincts. And that's what we're gonna have to, to do. You go back to foraging societies and there were social mechanisms for damping down arrogance and domination. Uh, we don't have a very good way of doing that. So we have to both learn from that, but also recognize that, and, and since that was the last formal question, uh, we have to deal with reality, both the, the reality of what the human animal is and the reality of the degraded, the degraded state of the ecosphere. We're not talking about what might have worked if we had started doing this, you know, a thousand years ago or 500 years ago. We're talking about a planet that much of it is, is unrecoverable in human time. Uh, and again, I don't say that to be simply depressing but to help us realize, it's what helped me realize the nature of change that's necessary. Um, and I know everything I've said is unsatisfying, uh, but I don't think anybody has a satisfying answer to any of this. But I do believe based on my own experience that when people come together and tell the truth to each other like this, things become possible that one couldn't imagine until that truth was told. Uh, maybe that's a thin reed on which to lean for hope. Uh, but at the end of the book, Wes and I basically renounce the concept of hope. Uh, uh, I, I once gave a couple of talks called, hope is for the weak and hope is for the lazy. Um, I'm, I'm really not interested in hope at the moment. I'm interested in getting up every morning and trying to ask what will, what can I contribute to make my own life and the lives of other more meaningful and to create the possibility of greater options for future generations? And even if I fail at that, um, it makes my life meaningful and worthwhile. So one of the things we always have to answer in organizing is, well, if you're telling me I need to renounce the dominant culture, you know, what makes life worthwhile? And that's the only answer I have. Uh, I spent about half my life trying to be normal, you know, trying to be a good American, <laughs> trying to be a good consumer. And all I know is it was miserable and I was miserable. And that when I uh, started to understand the depth of these crises and started changing the way I lived and changing the people I hung out with and changing the way I spent my time, uh, I became more aware of how deep the problems run, but I became more committed to trying to find that meaning. And this is one of those ways I think we have to talk personally about why, you know, why, why would someone, and many of you fit this category, why would someone dedicate, you know, a half a century of their life to a cause that seems to have failed? Well, it's because it, what, it, what gives meaning to life. And I'll end with, again, I'm feeling kind of emotional and it, it made me think of an old friend of mine named Abe Oshiroff, who's been dead now for some time. Abe was one of the last living members of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade who fought in the Spanish Civil War. He was CP until 56, till the Hungry episode, and a lifelong, a lifelong radical activist after that. And, and Abe used to always talk about being authentic. And one day I finally asked him, I said, Abe, what do you mean about, what do you mean by the term authentic? And in his raspy Brooklyn uh, voice uh, that was peppered with obscenities, he said, what does it fucking mean to be fucking authentic? He said, oh, I'll tell you the fucking answer to that. That's fucking easy. That was Abe. I can't do the Brooklyn accent. He said, a moment of authenticity is when what you think and what you say and what you do are all cut from the same cloth. 
He said, we often think things we're afraid to say out loud, and we're often afraid to act on what we say. And he said, when you reach him, I'm getting emotional because Abe was a dear friend and his death was a great loss, but I love the way he lives in my memory. He said, when you think and speak and act from the same place, that is an authentic moment. And he said, there is nothing in human experience to match that experience of authenticity. And so when I talk to people, especially younger people, I, I usually invoke Abe and say, that's the goal. We're all trying to live authentic lives. And when we can do that, it's, it's an experience that's hard to really replicate through any other, any other avenue in human life. So with that, uh, uh, shut up and turn it back to Richard. Okay, should, should I turn it off? Turn off the recording. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609 or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org. Dot org.